Hey everybody and welcome to our fourth numerical analysis lecture. This is going to be the last of our root finding algorithms. And unlike the other algorithms that we've discussed, uh, the fixed point algorithm doesn't solve the equation f of x equals zero, it solves the equation f of p equals p. So in other words, the y coordinate and the x coordinate are the same. And to get us rolling, I'll de define in earnest uh, exactly what a fixed point is. A function y equals f of x has a fixed point at x equal p exactly when f evaluated at p equals p. So in other words, you take the x value x equal p and plug it into the function f of x and you get p. Do we know any functions like that? Well, maybe we do. Uh, what about f of x equals sine x? x equals 0 is a fixed point. If we take 0 and plug it into the sine function, we get 0. So f of x equals sine of x has a fixed point, x equals 0. Uh, can we think of some other functions that might have fixed points? Since we uh, talked about the sine function, maybe something closely related to sine has a fixed point. Eh, that was almost too easy. That's kind of like cheating. Uh, tangent has a numerator of sine of x, so of course whenever sine of x is zero, tangent of x is going to be zero. Uh, which means x equals zero is a fixed point as f of zero equals tangent of zero equals zero. So you plug the x coordinate x equals zero into the tangent function and you get back zero. The x coordinate and the y coordinate are one and the same, zero. Can we think of uh, other fixed points, other functions that have fixed points? Uh, let's see if we can come up with some. Now, what about this function? f of x equals x. Well, if I had any pride at all, I'd be ashamed to put this up here as an example. Uh, it's an example, but it's really a trivial example just because of the way the function is defined. You take x and you plug it into f of x and you get back x. So every x value, every real number is a fixed point of that function. Well, that's not very enlightening. Uh, like I said, if I had any pride, if I had any decency, I wouldn't have even put it up here as an example. But maybe we can do some less trivial examples. Let me think if I can come up with some. Okay. Um, this is less trivial and yet uh, still simple enough that it's somewhat obvious. f of x equals x squared. And it has two fixed points. Uh, 
x equals 0 and x equal 1. Plug in 0 to f of x, we get 0. Plug in 1 to f of x, we get 1. Let's see. We're on a roll. Let's try this one. f of x equals x cubed. Uh, does it have fixed points? Uh, yeah, it does. It actually has three of them. x equal negative 1, x equal 0, x equal positive 1. Take negative 1, plug it into f of x, we get negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1. Plug x equals 0 into f of x, we get 0 cubed, we get 0. Take x equal 1, plug it into f of x, we get 1 cubed, which is 1. So this function has three fixed points. And uh, maybe for future reference, we'll look at one more, or maybe two more. X, uh, f of x equals square root of x has two fixed points, x equals 0, x equals 1. If we square each of these, we get back exactly the number, that, I'm sorry, if we compute the square root of each of these, we get back exactly the number that we plugged in. And I guess just because we might want to look at this as an example, Let's carry this idea a little bit further. Uh, the cube root of x has fixed points. x equals negative 1, x equals 0 x equal positive 1. Now this is more than enough to drive home the point of what a fixed point is. But uh, I think this multitude of examples will be helpful in illustrating some other points uh, as we continue in the lecture. Uh, something we really haven't done with any of these examples is uh, considered uh, what their graphs look like. And maybe that's the, the thing we need to do next. Let's look at all of the graphs of these functions and see if they have any common features, any identifying characteristics where we can look at the function and go, ah, it's got a fixed point. Uh, even if the function is some sort of uh, weird function, it has a pathological definition. Uh, if we see the graph of it, we can go, ah, it has a fixed point. Uh, sometimes the graph of a function tells us more about the function than uh, the algebraic definition. So let's look at these functions graphically and see if there's some sort of common theme here. Here's the graph of a function, f of x equals x squared, that, that has a fixed point. And here are the two fixed points, 1, 1, and 0, 0. Now, let me superimpose over this graph 
the graph of another function that has fixed points. Uh, that trivial function that I was talking about, that function where every x value is a fixed point. Uh, I was ashamed that I put that up as an example, but maybe now it's a, a good thing I did. Um, it may serve as a benchmark, so to speak, by which we measure all other functions that uh, are candidates for having fixed point. So let me superimpose over this graph the graph of f of x equals x. And I guess maybe the thing that we want to note, and it may be obvious, but maybe not. I'm not sure if this should be obvious or not. But the graph of f of x equals x squared intersects the graph of f of x equals 0, in which every point is a fixed point f of x equals x squared intersects the graph of f of x equals 0, right where f of x equals x squared has fixed points. And, I, you know, it, it, it kind of makes sense. If a function has a fixed point x, then when we plug x into the function, we get x back. In other words, a function only has a fixed point if there's some x value such that f of x equals x. So the graph of any function that has a fixed point will intersect the graph of f of x equals 0 only at the fixed points. Let's look at some more examples just to drive this home because this is a pretty important theme for understanding how the fixed point algorithm works. Here's another example of a function that has fixed points, f of x equals x cubed. Uh, and if you remember, we said that f of x equals x cubed has three fixed points, negative 1, 0, and positive 1. And sure enough, at x equal negative 1, we have the fixed point, negative 1, negative 1. At x equals 0, we have the fixed point, 0, 0. At x equal 1, we have the fixed point, 1, 1. And not so coincidentally, we have our three fixed points. At those three points in which the graph of, whoa, 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 whoa. Please correct this. This is supposed to be f of x equals x. And uh, please correct that in the notes prior to this. I can't really rewind the video or I'd do it myself. f of x equals x. That's what this line is. Please correct that. Uh, the function f of x equals x cubed has fixed points in exactly those places where the graph of f of x equals x cubed intersects the graph of f of x equals x. And we see that the graph intersects in three places. And those are exactly the three places where our function has a fixed point. Uh, here's a good example. f of x equals cube root of x, or x to the one-third. Uh, oddly enough, it has the same fixed points as its inverse, x cubed. Hmm. 
You know, I guess that's not so much of a coincidence after all, is it? Maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we have a fixed point at x equal 1, y equal 1. And we have a fixed point at x equals 0, y equals 0. Fixed point at negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. The graph is shaped differently. And believe it or not, this is going to affect how the fixed point algorithm works for each of these points. The fixed point algorithm will work differently for this function than it will for its inverse, f of x equals x cubed. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about that right now, but... Uh, the shape of the graph as far as concavity and the slope is going to have something to do with uh, the way that the fixed point algorithm behaves in the vicinity of each fixed point. And since we're at it, we might as well do one of uh, this function's cousins, uh, the square root of x. Another example, square root of x equals x squared. It has exactly the same two fixed points that its uh, inverse or semi-inverse x squared has. Square root of 0 is 0. Square root of 1 is 1. So x equals 0, y, uh, x equal 1 are fixed points. This graph is shaped differently than f of x equals x squared. For that reason, the fixed point somehow or other, the fixed point algorithm, is going to behave differently for this function than it does for its uh, inverse, I'll use that term loosely, f of x equals x squared. And it has something to do with the concavity and the slope. Okay, the last of our examples to revisit. And once I got into this thing, I was almost kind of sorry I did. Uh, this is pretty complicated. Now, remember we said that tangent x has a fixed point, x equals zero. What we didn't know at that time is that it has more than one fixed point. And when we draw the graph of f of x equals tangent x and the graph of y equals x, I better label that. Uh, we can see that uh, the graph of tangent x intersects the graph of y equals x, or f of x equals x, in more than one place. They intersect right here. And uh, what exactly is that point? Darned if I know. Uh, maybe we'll use the fixed point algorithm to find it. Uh, what is the, what are the coordinates of this point? Darn if I know. And if we think about it, this graph extends infinitely from left to right. And so it's going to intersect this portion of the graph as it gets closer to its vertical asymptote. Someplace right up here, they're going to intersect. And similarly, since this point extends infinitely from right to left, the graph of uh, y equals x is going to intersect the graph of tangent x uh, somewhere down here as this graph gets closer to its asymptote. And then the graph of tangent x continues and repeats itself uh, every, what, pi units. 
So son of a gun, actually, uh, this function has infinitely many fixed points, and they're not trivial. Now, the main portion of tangent x, so that portion between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, has three fixed points. And you know what? These, I, I don't really think, have numerical significance in the sense that uh, we can say, uh, oh, 5 pi over 6 or you know, 7 pi over 6 or something like that. Uh, now I don't think it works out that way. I, I don't think that these points work out to be rational multiples of pi. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But anyway, those are our fixed points for tangent of x. And now that we've looked a bit at fixed points, let's talk about the fixed point algorithm for computing the root of the function f of x equals x, or computing the root of the equation f of x equals x. Okay, fixed point algorithm. Here's our application. Find solutions of the equation f of p equals p, where f of x is differentiable and has a fixed point, x equal p. And as input, we have the definition of the function f of x, which has the fixed point x equal p. And f of x also has to have the characteristic that the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1 in some interval a, b, which contains the fixed point. So here's what I'm saying. In order for this algorithm to work, there has to be some interval a, B on the x-axis uh, containing the fixed point P. And it has to be the case that the magnitude of the first derivative or the absolute value of the first derivative has to be less than 1 throughout this entire interval. We have to be able to have some open interval containing p such that throughout this open interval, the absolute value of the first derivative is less than 1. If we can't find such an interval, the algorithm won't work. Uh, max the maximum number of iterations terminate if the number of iterations exceeds max. Tolerance, end the program when two successive approximations differ by tolerance. And print the last approximation as the solution. And we also have to have one more thing as input. First approximation, x naught, and you'll never guess where this approximation has to come from. Well, maybe you will. Our first approximation has to be contained in an interval which contains the fixed point. And throughout this interval, the derivative has to be less than 1 in magnitude. So, first approximation, x of naught. In the interval, 
a b. And yes, that really is a b. And yes, I am talking about that interval. If our first approximation comes from an interval which contains our fixed point, and this interval is such that the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1 throughout that interval, this algorithm is going to work. If that's not true, guess what? Our algorithm is going to keep iterating, and it's going to careen off into space, never to be heard from again. Uh, which is why we have this variable. It may be that our first approximation isn't in an interval containing the fixed point and such that the derivative is less than one in magnitude throughout. And in that case, this algorithm isn't going to converge to the fixed point. It's just going to go off into the sunset, never to be heard from again. So after a certain number of iterations, we just stop the program and say, program failed. Now, do I need anything else? Probably. But that's all I can think of right now. So let's see how this algorithm works. Here's how this thing works. The algorithm is based on the premise that if the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1 in an interval containing the fixed point P, then any point P sub 0 in the interval will be an acceptable first approximation of P. And every successive approximation will be a better approximation of P. And this sequence of approximations will converge to P. Let me clarify something that I set up here just to make sure that there's no possible way that we can misconstrue what I have written. Let me be a little bit more deliberate and precise here. The algorithm is based on the premise that if f prime, the magnitude of the derivative, is less than 1, throughout an interval containing the fixed point P, then any point P naught in the interval will be an acceptable first approximation of P. So we have to have some interval AB containing the fixed point such that the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1 throughout this interval. Uh, I'm not trying to say that if the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1 at some point in the interval, this will work. I'm, I'm saying the magnitude of the derivative has to be less than 1 throughout this interval. And then we can pick any point in this interval as our initial approximation. Submit that as the first approximation, and we can sit back and let the good times roll. This thing's going to converge. And we'll, we'll see why uh, graphically in just a minute. Uh, to see how and why this works, uh, let's consider a, a function f of x differentiable that has a fixed point. And we can tell this function has a fixed point because it intersects the graph y equals x. 
So right where the graph of f of x intersects the graph of y equals x, we have a fixed point. And we'll call the x and y coordinates of that fixed point p. Clever, huh? But seriously, folks, uh, notice also that the derivative of this function is the magnitude of the derivative of this function is clearly less than 1. Uh, the slope of this graph is clearly less than 45 degrees this way, or negative 45 degrees if you want to get technical. Uh, the derivative is negative, but the magnitude of the derivative is clearly less than 1. The slope is less than, uh, the magnitude of the slope is less than 1. So, according to what we've said, the fixed point algorithm will converge. And any point in this interval in which the derivative is less than 1 in magnitude should be a first a good first approximation. So let me pick a point in this interval, not too close to the solution. Oh, what the heck. I'll pick it way the heck over here. This will be my piece of zero. And this point on the graph will be P sub zero, F of P sub zero. And the way this algorithm works is that, and you know, I might not have explained that. The way this algorithm works, F evaluated at an approximation becomes the next approximation. So P1 is equal to F evaluated at P0. So how do I find F evaluated at P0 on my, on my x-axis? Let's see. Since the y coordinate of this point is f evaluated at p sub zero, every point on the horizontal line that I'm about to draw will have a y coordinate of f of p sub zero. And that horizontal line intersects the graph of y equal x right here at this point. Now, do I know what the coordinates of this point are? Well, I should. This point is on the same horizontal line as this point. And the y coordinate of this point is f of p naught. And every point on this horizontal line is going to have the same y coordinate, f evaluated at p sub naught. So I know what the y coordinate of this point is. This point has y coordinate f of p sub naught. Now, what's the x-coordinate of this point? Well, notice that this point is also on the graph of y equals x. This is the line in which every point has the same x and y coordinate. In other words, every point on this line is such that the x-coordinate is the same as the y-coordinate. So if the y coordinate of this point is f evaluated at p sub naught, 
then the x coordinate is f of p sub naught. And that's going to give me my second approximation. And here's why. I'll draw a vertical line from this point now. Down to the x-axis. And I'll put arrows here so that when I look at this drawing retrospectively, I'll know what I did first. This is f of p sub naught. But this is also going to be my next approximation, p sub 1. So, I take P1 and I plug it into the function. And I get the point p sub 1, f of p sub 1. Now notice something. My, 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 uh, my approximation p sub 1 is closer to the fixed point than my initial approximation. And notice that on the graph, the point on the graph is closer to the fixed point than was the initial point on the graph. Now, what do I do to get my next approximation? I take my current approximation, p sub 1, And I plug it into the function f. So this is my next approximation for the fixed point. Well, how do I know what that is? Um, let me travel horizontally to the line y equals x. What's the coordinate of this point? Let's see, x is p1. So f of x is f of p1. And you know what? Let me write that a little bit bigger. Let me not cram all of this into a short space. Okay, I want you to be able to read this. I took P1 and I plugged it into the function f of x. So I have the point P1 f of P1. That, these are the coordinates of this point on the graph of y equals f of x. Huh, well, what's the y coordinate? If I travel horizontally till I intersect the graph of y equals x, I know what the coordinates of this point are. This point and this point are on the same horizontal line, so they have the same y coordinate, f of p1. So this point and this point have the same y coordinate, f evaluated at p sub 1. So what's the x-coordinate of this point? 
Well, this point is also on the graph of y equals x. So y equals f is the graph of all points whose x and y coordinates are equal to each other. If the y coordinate is f of p sub 1, that means that the x coordinate is f of p sub 1. Cool. And so this actually gives me P2, my next approximation for the fixed point. And here's what I do. I just come down. Down, down, down. Down, right here, and this is my p sub 2, f evaluated at p sub 1. And essentially, I continue this process. What's p3 going to be? f evaluated at p2. What's p4 going to be? F evaluated at P3, and so on. And notice that if the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1 in an interval that contains the fixed point, <laughs> then my approximations do converge on the fixed point. Here was my first approximation, not even close to the fixed point. But my second approximation, Right here, much closer to the fixed point. My third approximation right here, even closer to the fixed point. And my next approximation is probably going to be about here, and the one after that may be around here. So this is how the algorithm works. Provided that the derivative of the function has a magnitude less than 1 in some interval containing the fixed point. Well, what happens if that's not the case? We'll see in just a second. Uh, let me stress something that I'm not sure that I stressed earlier, and I certainly should have. Uh, we take the initial approximation, p naught. And we get our first approximation by plugging it into f of x. And each successive approximation is obtained by plugging the current approximation into the function. To get p1, we plug p0 into f. To get p2, we plug p1 into f. To get p3, we plug p2 into f, and so forth and so on. Now, let's see what happens. If the derivative has a magnitude greater than or equal to 1. Okay, just for the sake of example, let's see what happens. We have a function. And it does have a fixed point at PP. But notice that in the vicinity of this fixed point, the slope of the graph is very steep. Clearly, the magnitude of this slope is much greater than 1. So the magnitude of the derivative, much greater than 1 in the vicinity of the fixed point. The fixed point algorithm is not going to work. And I'm going to give the algorithm every chance to succeed, and it's still going to fail. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my first approximation and have it be very, very, very close to the fixed point. I'm going to put my, my first approximation right here, P0. 
So P0, my first approximation. P1 is going to be F evaluated at P0. So in other words, I take P0 and I plug it into the function and I get P0, F of P0. This is also, f of p0 is also going to be my p sub 1. But how do I know where this is on the x-axis? Well, here's what I'll do. Just so that I can find this value on the x-axis, I'm going to travel horizontally to the point y equals x. This point and this point are on the same horizontal line, so they have the same y coordinate, f of p sub naught. So, let's see, where should I put this? f of p sub naught, that's the y coordinate of this line, a uh, y coordinate of this point. Uh, this point is also on the line y equals x, which means that the x-coordinate of this point is the same as the y-coordinate. So, here's my x-coordinate, f of p sub naught. And remember what I was trying to do? I was trying to find where this value is on the x-axis. I can do that now. I'll just draw a vertical line down from this point. And this is P sub 1, which is F of P sub naught. And how do I know that the X coordinate of this point on the X axis is F of P sub naught? Because this point and this point are on the same vertical line, so they have the same x-coordinate, f of p sub naught. Now, I take p1, and I plug it into the function to get my next approximation for the figure. So here's our next approximation. This is P1, F of P1. F of P1 is my next approximation to the fixed point. But where do I find this on the x-axis? To find this point on the x-axis, or to find this value on the x-axis, here's what I do. I travel horizontally. I travel horizontally until I intersect the line y equals x. And because this point and this point are on the same horizontal line. They have the same y-coordinate, f of p sub 1. Okay, well, what's the x-coordinate of this point? Ah, this point is also on the graph of y equals x. And every point on this line, y equals x, is such that the x and y coordinates are identical. So the x coordinate of this point is also f of p sub 1. And to locate this value on the x axis, I just drop a vertical line from my new point.
The x coordinate of this point is the same as the x coordinate of this point because they're on the same vertical line. So let's see. This point has to have f of p sub 1 as its x coordinate. And this is also our p sub 2. Now let's see how we've done. Here was our first approximation, p sub 0, right next to the actual fixed point on the x-axis. p sub 0 is very close to our fixed point p on the x-axis. Our next approximation to p was p1, and it's farther away from p than the initial approximation. And now look at our p sub 2, our next approximation. It's even farther away from p. These approximations, p0, p1, p2, are getting farther and farther away from our the value of our fixed point p. This sequence of approximations is diverging away from our fixed point p. Why? Because the derivative of the function in the vicinity of our fixed point has a magnitude greater than or equal to 1. So the bottom line is the fixed point algorithm works if the fixed point is contained, or if the x coordinate of the fixed point is contained in an interval on the x axis throughout which the magnitude of the derivative is less than 1. If that is not the case, then we can't guarantee that the fixed point will, uh, algorithm will converge. In fact, if the magnitude of the derivative is greater than or equal to 1 throughout the interval containing the fixed point, absolutely the algorithm will not converge. 